us on the responsibility at the gates. Responsibility at the gates. If you've been with us and you are part of us in CTMI, the theme for the past few weeks has been gates. And so this week we are talking about responsibility at the gates. And I will bring again the definition. So in Hebrew, the word gates is shahar. And it means an opening. That is door or gate. City, port, porter. And responsibility. Well, so the, 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 I looked at the Collins English Dictionary to understand the meaning of, res, of responsible. It means having control or authority over. One is responsible if one is being accountable for one's actions and decisions. Able to take rational decisions without supervision. Accountable for one's own actions. And, a, and in financial terms, able to meet financial obligations of sound credit. Responsibility at the gates. You know, last week we looked at, what did we look at? We looked at mending the gates. That's true. And that focus was on the gates of, that pertain to us as individuals. But today we're going to look at God's gates. And uh, if we look at this, we, the, we, the scripture we read, for those of you just joined us, we read um, Psalm 100. And verse 4 in particular, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his cause with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. And it's so awesome that one of the songs we sang today, we were declaring that with a grateful heart, with a grateful heart, we lift our hands to the Lord. A song by, um, written by Sinach. With a grateful heart, we lift our hands to the Lord, declaring his greatness. The Lord wants you and I to enter his gates with thanksgiving. And this could be likened to the gates of Zion. <laughs> and you may say, but what is Zion? Zion is, is, the, is the city of David. It's a hill upon which the, the temple was built. It could be likened to the gates, and, and, if, and I think in Psalm 87, I think. Is it Psalm 87? It says, verse 2, it says concerning Zion that the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. It could be symbolic of the gates of Jerusalem. Remember, last week we were talking about we used mending of the gates of the wall, the gates of, of Jerusalem that were burnt down to discuss the gates of our lives. And I hope we remember those three gates that we are to mend. And it, it could be likened entering the gates of, 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 of the temple. It could be likened to entering the gates of his house, the church. It could be likened to entering the gates of his presence. But essentially the bottom line is that the Lord wants you and I to enter his gates with thanks. Amen. Because it's so easy to be over, over, overwhelmed and, and blinded by the issues that concern self that concern your immediate state, such that you forget that God has been good to you. You forget, brethren, we are in December of 2022. Many started and have not made it to this state. The Lord gave us a word higher ground in CTMI on the 31st of December, 2021. And we can look at where we are today and where we were then and see that indeed the Lord has taken us out higher in various levels. And we know that this is, this, is not, this is just the baseline because there's still higher God is saying that we need to go and gave us things that some of us may need to do to go even to that higher place he has. So it's a continuum. And he's saying, enter. 
And why are we to enter? But it's, it's all a matter of knowing. You've got to understand why are we to thank God? Why do, does the Lord want us to thank him in his gates? Verse 3 of um, Psalm 100 says, Know that the Lord himself is God. You are to know that God is who he is. The Bible says he's the self-existent one. He's all-sufficient. He is God all by himself. He doesn't need you and I to fight for him. Some fight for their God. Yeah. Some defend their God. Some carry their God. But our God is God all by himself. He can fight his battles. We saw today, when we were praying, when we were praying, Proverbs 14, verse 19, we saw that evil will bow down to the good. hey, hey. hey. Before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Why? Because God has said it all by himself. Because he is the one who will fight our battles. He is the one who goes before us like fire. As fire because he is the consuming fire. So we are to thank him because we are to know. You have to have a knowledge. Because knowledge, it is knowledge that births devotion. It is knowledge that births obedience. Because it, but the Bible says in, in Hosea 4, 6, that my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you don't know why you do what you do, you won't even do it. You will take it lightly. And so God wants you and I to know that the Lord himself is God. You don't need to defend your God. You don't need to fight for your God. This is our God. We do not need to fight for him. We do not need to defend him because he is God all by himself. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. And therefore, if you know that God made you and not you yourself, you are not your own. It is not therefore your prerogative to take your life. It is not therefore your prerogative to say what you do with your life. Much as he's given you a free will, we come, therefore, to show you the truth of his word. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And why does that mean? What does that tell us? Because we are the sheep of his pasture, we need a shepherd. Hey, hey. And it's not weakness to have to need a shepherd. That is indeed knowledge. To know that to navigate this life, you need one that is bigger than you. Yeah. And he is the good shepherd. And he talks about who he is in Psalm 23. I encourage you to read it. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Because he's not left you alone. He has chosen to be your shepherd. And he wants you to know, therefore, that you are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Because Jesus then said in John that he is the door through which we enter in and out and find good pine pasture. He is that gate. We saw that last week. He is ultimately the gate that enables us men those gates of our lives. Oh, shake Handa. We need to thank him at those gates, the gates of his presence. We were the gates of his presence in the time of worship. There were those whose eyes were open to see. There were angels dancing in our midst. And so, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. If someone has it, please read. Hebrews 13, 15, are we there? Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. With Jesus' help, let us continually offer our sacrifice of praise to God by proclaiming the glory of his name. Ooh. Hallelujah. Amen. That's an awesome version. Can I have another version, please? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Thank you, my brother. 
So, the, so the, 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 the writer here is saying that through Jesus Christ, let us come continually. It is not just a one-off thing. Continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. So we are, inter we are to intermix thanksgiving with praise. Responsibility at the gate. We are to continually, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanksgiving, giving thanks to his name. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And what does 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 tell us? Which is, is kind of similar to this Hebrews 12. So Hebrews 13, verse 16. And I looked at it and said, wow, Lord, you are awesome. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. No matter what happens, always be thankful. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, what we saw in Hebrews that it is through Christ we are to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him, his name. And here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, we're being told that if 1 Thessalonians, look at my open Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, we are to, verse 8, 18, sorry. In everything, in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So it is God's will that in everything you give thanks to God. For it's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Through Christ Jesus we are to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So you are to intertwine thanksgiving with praise. Amen. And so, we have said that this comes because we have a knowledge of who God is Amen. to us and why Amen. we are to thank him and to praise him. Amen. We want to understand the relationship Jesus had with the gates of Jerusalem. Looking at that at Hebrews 13. Let's look at verse 10 to 12. We're looking at responsibility at the gates. We're going on a journey. Don't get lost because it will all make sense at the end. If it isn't making sense now. Hebrews 13, 10 to 12. Roko Shika Basanda. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10 to 12. We have an altar from which those who serve the covenant have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Thank you, my brother. So, we're talking about responsibility at the gate. We've established that the Lord wants you and I to enter his gates with thanksgiving, the gates of his presence, the gates of his house, the gates of that your secret place. The Lord wants you to enter it with thanksgiving, mixed with praise. And here we're seeing Jesus has now come on the scene. It says that we have an altar from which those who serve the tab in the tabernacle have no right to eat. So, so, the, so the writer is bringing us back to the time when God you, was, was re resided within the tabernacle. He met with his people in the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, there was an understanding of how atonement was to be made for their sins. So once a year, the priests uh, during the Feast of Atonement would take the blood of animals and enter 
the holy place. It says, we have an oath upon which those who serve the tabernacle had no right to eat. And so the blood, the blood was sprinkled on the altar to atone for the sins of the people every year. But that animal from which the blood was taken could not be eaten by the priest. It says, they had no right to eat it. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering are burned outside the camp. So the bodies of those sacrificial animals were burned outside the gates. It couldn't stay where the people were. He says, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify so that he will sanctify us with his precious blood. Because you know Jesus is the ultimate sacrificial lamb. Yeah. He is the sinless, spotless lamb. But so that his blood could wash away our sins. Not just that annual process of the Feast of Atonement. But always, he said that through his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. He also, he went and hung and suffered for us outside the gate. The cross of Calvary, Golgotha, was outside the gate. He went outside the gate to bear the shame so that you and I would not have to suffer shame. Outside the gate was where the outcasts were sent. Remember the lepers we talked about last week were outside the gate. The dead bodies were buried outside the gates uh -huh. yeah. and so anything that was not supposed to be about um, amongst the masses was outside the, the gates. gates so note jesus relationship with the gates was that he suffered died for you and i such that his precious blood could sanctify us and it happened outside the gates responsibility at the gates let us therefore, let us now look at Luke chapter 7. Roche Brahanda. We now want to tie all this together because Jesus is telling us something. We talked about mending the gate last week, and if you don't know what gates of your life you're to mend, I encourage you to listen to that message again. Now we're looking at Luke chapter 7. And I want we want to read from verses 11 to 15. Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 15. Soon afterwards, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain with a great crowd following him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The boy who had died was the only son of a widow, and many mourners from the village were with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Do not cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk to those around him. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. We're talking about responsibility at the gate. Amen. And so, we want to tie this all together because everything we're talking about is very relevant to you and I. Amen. It's in verse, in verse um, 12. It tells us of this Luke 7, as Jesus, so Jesus was coming into the city while a group of mourners were coming out of the city. Remember, the word gate also means city. Ooh. People were going out, people were coming in. But there's a significant thing we need to understand. As Jesus had to bear the sin of you and I and die outside the gates, they were bringing a dead boy outside the gates to go and be buried. 
And at that point of meeting, it tells us in verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion yes. for her and said to her, do not weep. What did Jesus do? What did he say he did? He walked over to the cross. What did Jesus do? So we, we just went now. Oh, verse 13. Told, told his heart too. overflowed. No, verse two, his heart overflowed. Verse 12. This, we're looking at verse 13. He felt compassion. And what is compassion? We've understood it's love in action. We've been taught it's love in action. If you and I are to fulfill assignment, we need to have compassion. You can't witness to those you don't have compassion for. If you haven't got a burden for something, you won't even think about it. You won't even lose sleep. If you haven't got a burden for the lost, you will walk by the lost every day and feel nothing. If you haven't got a burden for the sick, you will be in the midst of sick people and feel nothing. If you haven't got a, a burden for life, you will be in the midst of people committing all sorts of acts that bring about death and feel nothing. Jesus was coming into the city. Outside the gate, he saw a dead corpse being carried. The scripture says he was the son of a widow. He felt compassion. We're talking about responsibility at the gate. To fulfill purpose, you need to be have compassion. You need otherwise. The other word for compassion is passion. You need to have passion for something. Because it's your passion that drives you. It is a, it's a sad thing to live life passionless. Because if you've got no passion, then you've got no motivation. And many a time, it's our, our passions drive the careers we find ourselves in. And that kind of makes sense because you will spend the majority of your working life doing something. And it has to be something you like. And that is why you don't force your children to do things they don't like. You encourage them along the lines of their strength. Because that's where their passion is. Yes. And, with, and I'm speaking now to parents because sometimes the enemy steals the passion of your children. Such that they find themselves passionate about the wrong things. But God has already ignited something that they're to be passionate about. And so verse 13 is saying, And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And so forth. So, with, passion, with compassion, there is an action. With something we say. You can't have passion for something. You can't have compassion and not say something. You cannot have compassion. And, and what do we do in prayer? We open our mouth. You speak the word. And so, if you have a passion for something, you will say something. Yeah. Either in prayer or in declaration, that you will open your mouth. And so, in verse 13, he said, Do not weep. And he came, in verse 14, he said, He came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. What do we notice here? He was speaking to the dead man as though he were alive. He was speaking to the dead as though they were alive. What does Romans 4 tell us? 17. Can someone read it, please? Romans 4, 17. Romans 4 verse 17. Oh, 
What's joy for those whose disobedience is Are you reading for Romans 4 verse 17? Apologies. Romans 4 verse 17. That is what the scriptures mean when they when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happens because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who brings into existence what did not exist before. Thank you. So we're seeing here that Jesus called things that are not as though they were. We're talking about responsibility at the gate. You are to speak. You are to speak those things that are not as though they were. He says, for the he says, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the sight of him who whom he believed. Even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. He was willing, at this time, Father Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac. Trusting that he who had called him a father of many nations was well able to cause life to come from the dead. If this was the only son he'd given him and was telling him to sacrifice him, he would do what God said he, God said to do because he knew that God would do what he said he would do. Cause him to be a father of many nations. And so we see here that Jesus was speaking to the dead man they were carrying and was saying, Let's read, let's read exactly what he said. Oh, Jesus, you are faithful. There's nothing in the word that is out of sync with what God expects of us. It says in that verse 14, and he came up and touched the coffin. It, it was called a coffin. A coffin is not where you put living people. A coffin is where you put dead people. <laughs> it symbolizes death. And, and, and the bearers came to a halt and he said, Young man, I say to you, he didn't say dead man. He didn't say corpse. He said, young man, young man, I say to you, arise. Responsibility at the gates. The authority you have in Christ Jesus is not a head thing. It's, it needs to be... From the head to the heart to the mouth. Amen. You speak it. Responsibility at the gate. Because when you are speaking his word, then you can at the gate thank him. As you are coming before his presence, you know to thank him. Because you know that he who said it will do it. He said... This is Jesus saying to the young man. And why did he say that? Because he already had compassion. He has something in him to say, I will not on my watch. Will this widow sorrow? Not on my watch will this widow live life without a husband and now without a son. And the dead man, no long story, the Bible says, and the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. So I want us to understand why this is important. We're talking about responsibility at the gate. Jesus knew his assignment. If you are to walk if you are to walk in purpose, you need to take responsibility. You know, those who were with us on Friday, we talked about God's gifts, the gifts of God. Not the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of God. Yeah. And it, it listed, we, we saw certain things, we saw service, we saw prophecy, we saw teaching, we saw... Um, um, Encouragement, giving, giving, service, service. Teaching. and these things come out from a place of responsibility. It comes out of the place, and we said being responsible is the act of what did we say? Is the act of speaking, being accountable for.
for one's actions and decisions. Able to take rational decisions without supervision. Accountable for one's own actions. If one has a, if one has an assignment, and you will know by the spirit what your assignment is. Your assignment is to serve or to encourage. It comes out naturally. You don't need someone to say, right, I will need you to encourage sir, so, so, and so on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> no. It will just come naturally because you will be in sync with the Holy Spirit and you will know, mm, I need to speak to X, Y, Z. I need to find out how X, Y, Z is doing. What is your passion? What are you passionate about? What is your assignment? And how are you acting on it? And so Jesus had a responsibility to walk in assignments. You may say why. Let's look at a few scriptures. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. What does it say? 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. And John 10.10. 10. 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin, which is separating himself from God and offending him by the acts of disobedience, indifference, or rebellion, is of the devil and takes his inner character and moral values from him, not God. For the devil has sinned and violated God's law from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. To the works of the devil. Thank you. So the, the B part of that tells us the Son of God appeared for this purpose. Who is the Son of God here? Jesus Christ. He appeared for this purpose that he may destroy the works of the devil. He knew his assignment was to destroy the works of the devil. John 10 10, please. John 10 10. But this purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. Thank you. So we saw in 1 John 3, 8, B, the B part, that is for, for, the, for, it, well, for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest that he may destroy the works of the devil. We see in John 10, 10 that he came that we may have life. And have it to the full. So he knew that he knew. Jesus knew that his purpose was. To fulfill. To destroy the works of the devil. To give life to the full. And so if his life. If his assignment. His purpose. Is to give life to the full. To destroy the works of the devil. He cannot see death around him. He cannot see death around him and keep quiet. So what is your assignment? Are you cognizant of your assignment? Don't be distracted. By so Jesus walked in a, he had a responsibility to walk in assignment. We are talking about responsibility at the gate. Jesus fulfilled his assignment of destroying the works of the devil. It was the work of the devil to bring about premature death in the life of the widow's son. And so, he assumed his responsibility at the gate. Jesus felt the responsibility fueled by compassion to combat death outside the gates. Why? Because he knew he was going to die outside the gates. His death outside the gate, his suffering outside the gate was for you and I to walk in life. Responsibility at the gate is that he, Jesus, walked in assignment because he is the resurrection and the life. He told Martha in John chapter 11 verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. No, no. He said in John chapter 4 verse 6, I am, the, the A part I believe, that I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said he was he was the way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Amen. And executed who he was at the gate. 
And so, the question, the question therefore is, what is your responsibility? What is your responsibility at the gate of praise? At the gate of his presence? At the gate of assignment? Sorry, the gate of the sanctuary. At the gate. Open the door. So, so Jesus felt a responsibility. And the question to yourself is, what is your responsibility? We will round up by letting you know what your responsibility is. One, it's your responsibility to know and acknowledge the sovereignty of God as we saw in Psalm 100, verse 3 and 5. It is your responsibility to know and acknowledge God's sovereignty. Sovereignty To know that who he is and what he is to you. It is your responsibility to enter the portal of his presence, the gate of his presence with thanksgiving, as we are told in Psalm 100, verse 4. And we are thanking him for the privilege of being his own. The, pri the privilege of being in receipt of his love. The privilege of being joint heirs with Christ. The privilege of knowing that we are sanctified through his blood. We are thanking him for the fact that he died, he suffered, that you and I may live. It is our responsibility to praise and thank him for who he is. Just as we saw in Thessalonians, in First Thessalonians, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 18, and in Hebrews 13, verse 15. Amen. It is your responsibility to guard your heart with all diligence. Essentially, I would rather say it's your responsibility to mend your gates. Mm. And that is last week's message. It's your response. What were those three gates the Lord gave us last week? Say it, son. Say it. Our gates. Yes. Hearts. Gates of submission. Gates of submission. God bless you. So it's our, it's, it's our, it's our responsibility. To guard our hearts, the eye to in short to mend those three gates, the Lord tells us the eye gate, the heart gate, and the gate of submission. And it's summed up in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, which we prayed. And I, can someone read that Philippians 4, please? Verse 8, because we prayed it last week. We didn't actually read it. Thank you, my brother. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In Philippians 4 8. Yes. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. So this is our responsibility. To, these are the things we need to meditate on. It's, we need to take, it's our responsibility to meditate on these things because therefore it will enable us to mend our heart gate, our eye gate, and our submission gate. Because you will set your mind on things that are true, things that are noble or honorable, what is right or just, whatever thing is pure, whatever thing is lovely or virtuous, whatever is of good repute. repute. If there is excellence in it, if it's going to be praiseworthy. And so it's our responsibility to set our minds on this. It's also your responsibility to have compassion. The co compassion that drives you in the place of your assignment. 
as we saw in Luke 7, 13. It was compassion that drove Jesus to remember, yes, well, to, to do what he, he came to this life to do, to give life and life to the full, to destroy the works of the devil. So it is your responsibility to have compassion that drives you, otherwise to have passion. Be passionate for something in fulfillment of assignment. <laughs> If God has called you, he's called us all to, 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 to make disciples. Therefore, we need all to have compassion for the lost. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you know people that don't know Jesus right around you, you need to be burdened for them in prayer. The first step is to be at least burning, crying on your knees for their souls. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it is your responsibility to speak life at the gate of your secret place. Luke 7, 14. That therefore means that nothing dies around you. That's right. Wow. Nothing dies prematurely around you because that young boy would have died prematurely. It is an error for a parent to bury their child. And so, we want to pray. The Lord is calling you and I to take responsibility at the gates. And so we saw today Psalm 100 verse 4 that we enter his gates with thanksgiving. And Hebrews 13 verse 15 made us understand that we are to continually, continually offer up a sacrifice of thanks. With praise to God. Amen. Because this is God's will. I'm mixing 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 as well. Let us rise. Amen. Mighty God, Shaham Rakasanda. We're going to pray. We're going to make some declarations. Make a riba handa. Oh, koko ko. In the gate of God's presence. In the gate of his house, begin to thank God. Mark Asanda, position yourself in the spirit to be in the gate of his house, in the gate of his presence, in the gate of your secret place. Begin to thank God. Begin to thank him that you're hid with Christ in God. Begin to thank him. Roko Sheke Hey. Begin to thank him that you are hid with Christ in God. Begin to thank him. That is in, it's in him you live. It's in him you move. And it's in him you have your being. Mata Sheke Mahondo, Father, we thank you. Begin to thank him for, his, for enduring a shameful death. That you see no shame. Moko send it. He took the shame outside the gate so that you and I need not be ashamed. Roko Sanda, the Bible says that those who trust in him will not be put to shame. Reke Sanda, that why is that? It's because Jesus. Rocco Sanda endures your shame, endures my shame outside the gates. Rocco Sanda, he died the most shameful death. Begin to thank him. Rocco Shebreke, Rocco Sheke Mahodo, Rabba Sanda, Mighty Go Shabahanda, begin to thank him. Thank him for enjoying the shameful death that you might live. Rocco Satata, Rekeke, that you may live shame free. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Shabahanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Broko Sanda, we are grateful for your goodness. We are grateful for your mercy. We are grateful for your love. That you loved us, Lord, even when we were unlovable. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a passion. Thank you, Lord. Shut every head. That you've given us, Lord. Broko Sanda, a sense of direction. Father, thank you, Mahe. Robo, thank you that you are a good shepherd. Yes, Lord, we are the sheep. You've reminded us that we are the sheep of your pasture. Therefore, Lord, we thank you that we acknowledge the need for a shepherd. Oh, ho, ho. And you are the good shepherd who leads us beside the still water. Oh, Koshake, thank you, Lord. 
Mighty God, begin to speak life. Begin to speak the life of Jesus Christ to every dead situation. Begin to speak the life of Jesus Christ to every dead situation around you. Mantebe, anything that is dead, is it your career? Is it your business? Is it your prayer life? Is it your walk with God? Begin to speak life. Robo Shebrekete, begin to speak life. Robo Shebreke, Matatata. Begin to speak life. Begin to speak life. Robo Shebra Tatata. Reke Sanda. Begin to declare no premature death. No premature death. Nothing will die in your hands. Nothing will die around you. In CTMI. Nothing will die before it's time. Nothing will die. Rebeke Shabra. No, we speak your resurrection life. We acknowledge Jesus. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. Robo Shebrataka. We declare that nothing, nothing will die. No Kosanda. Begin to declare that you will not die. You will not die. You will not die before your time. Roko Shebrekeke. No one connected to you will die prematurely. Roko Satata. Begin to declare. No premature death. Roko Sanda in assignment, in purpose. Roko Koshe Brakatata. Reka Sanda. Your love for God will not die. Your passion for his things will not die. Roko Koshe Keke. Your children will not die. Your spouse will not die. Reka Sanda Rabasanda. Your assignments will not die. Your vision will not die. Reka Sanda. Begin to declare that you will not bury and you will not be buried. Roko Shebrakata. Father, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you are life. You are the resurrection. And you are the life. And I speak life. Rock or go to everything around us, Lord. Rock or shake it. Nothing dies around us. Nothing else dies in our hands. Nothing that you put in our hands dies. Robo Shebreke. Robo Mo. Yes, Lord. We are people of assignment. We are people of purpose. Thank you, Lord. Nothing dies around. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We say we are people that take responsibility at the gate. Robo Shebrekete. Robo Kosanda. We walk in assignment. We walk in purpose. Rock on Santa. We are passionate for that which you've given us passion for. Rock on Koshek Rekeke. Reke Santa. For that passion does not die. We give life to our passion. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We worship you. If you don't know Jesus, I invite you to know him. He is the God. The, the one true God. He is the one who in Psalm 100 tells us that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving. He is the one who in Psalm 100 we know that it is he, that he himself is God. He made us. We didn't make ourselves. He is the one who is your good shepherd that said we are the sheep of his pasture. Amen. To enjoy the life that comes from him, who is the resurrection and the life. I invite you to make him your Lord and Savior. Say after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus come into my heart. Into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I, I thank you for the blood that you shared for me outside the gate to wash away my sins. Thank you for bearing the shame so that I can live without shame. Thank you that because you died, eternal life is mine. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live for you. I renounce Satan and all his words. Thank you for saving me. Hallelujah. If you pray that prayer, you're now born again. We rejoice with you that your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God bless you. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.